All right. Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thanks for joining us and welcome to Greenstone's first Data Revenue Protection Analyzer webinar. Um, we're glad to have you with us today and hopefully the information that we share here is helpful and it brings some value to your farm. Um, we're excited to be partnering with Marin Bozik. He's an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota and he's a very well-known dairy expert. Before I pass it over to Marin, I do want to introduce our Greenstone panelists. We have um, our staff on hand here and they can help answer questions and then there, I mean, we're always available to answer any questions you have after. Um, so feel free to reach out to them. The first we have is Ben Benjamin Spitzley. He is our VP and commercial lending group manager for our dairy customers at Greenstone. He is kind of like our go-to dairy expert. Um, ben Malice is our Vice President of Crop Insurance. He's also on the call, and both of these gentlemen you can reach out to whenever if you have questions. They're a huge, uh, they're a great resource. Um, we also have Ryan uh, Cradleville, and he is a Greenstone Crop Insurance Specialist. He's actually based out of Traverse City, Michigan, and is our kind of DRP um, insurance, or sorry, yeah, DRP insurance specialist go to for Michigan. And then Robert Natrefa. Sorry, Robert, I messed up your lesson. So Robert is our senior crop insurance specialist for Wisconsin. He's based out of the Clintonville office. And I mean, both Ryan and Robert are great resources, um, just great tools to use. So definitely reach out to them. If you have any questions during the event or after, I um, mean, they'd be happy to help you. So before I turn it over to Mayor, I wanted to give a little bit of background on him. Um, he is an assistant professor at, for dairy foods, marketing, and economics at the University of Minnesota. Um, his research focuses on dairy policy analysis, uh, dairy risk analysis, and he works closely with Minnesota Milk Producers Association, the USDA, the Midwest Dairy Association. I mean, he's, he's done it all. So um, we're excited to have him with us today. He's actually the developer of Greenstone's DRP analyzer tool. Um, and so this afternoon, he's going to walk you through what that tool is, um, how you can use it. He'll do a demo of that. And then we're excited to have him share kind of like an update on the dairy market today because it has, I mean, it's always changing and it's changing even more drastically than normal due to the COVID virus. Um, so he's going to talk about the impact coronavirus has on that and then prices. And he will be happy to answer any questions that uh, you folks have for him. So. Um, with that being said, Marion, you can go ahead and take over and uh, get started. Thank you so much, Amber. Um, I hope everybody can hear me well. I hope everybody can see my slides, and I hope you guys are all healthy uh, and, and not going too crazy staying at home. Uh, uh, hopefully, you can at least uh, move around your farm and get some work done outside. Um, so, uh, we'll, uh, we'll go through the current economic and political situation a little bit, and then we'll dig into the tool um, and see uh, what's what's a reasonable thing to do right now, given everything that's going on, and then how Greenstone can help you be successful, have more stable income, and, and be more prosperous uh, in your dairy business. So uh, I am doing this webinar from home, so you may hear some noises that you otherwise you would not hear. For example, it's Wednesday, Garbage truck is just passing right now. They were actually waiting for me to start before they pass. It's coordinated. Uh, and, and at some point, my six month old uh, son may also uh, wish to come in and say a few words. Um, uh, I wasn't able to quite understand what his advice on risk management is yet, but he seems to have an opinion about it. Um, okay, so uh, we, are in a, we are living through a black swan times right now. So what is a black swan? Uh, it's an event that comes as a surprise, has a major effect, and it's often inappropriately rationalized after the fact. Oh, yeah, yeah, we saw it coming. Everybody should have seen it coming. You know, I gave a talk um, at the end of January, uh, sponsored by Greenstone and Compare together. I was down in Madison, Wisconsin, and we were talking about 2020 outlook, and I said, it's going to be a great year. You're going to rebuild your equity. Um, finally, a good year after five years of, of misery. Well, that that outlook didn't age really well, did it? Uh, you know, even though at that time we did have first cases confirmed in China, and um, the R naught for this um, virus was already uh, ex um, suspected to be high, with meaning that the virus was highly contagious that can be transmitted from humans to humans. We just did not see it as a serious enough threat 
to organize our entire forecast model around it. Um, and once it became clear that this is a real thing, uh, here's how the market reacted. Uh, it started sometimes in late February. Um, you see the Dow Jones, it had some of the biggest one day drops in its history and also the biggest one day jumps in the history. Some of the best days for investing are right now. Some of the worst days to, for investing are right now as well. One does not go with, with, without the other. You know, the, the worst days for some are the best days for others that know how to position themselves well um, you know, for this. So we are living through very volatile times. And even though the situation is pretty serious, I, I can't help but introduce some levity into it. So uh, you know, the throwback Thursday may look something like this. Um, at least we thought a few weeks ago, now the situation with the toilet paper has finally stabilized. Um, and also now that we are all staying at home, some people have discovered, rediscovered the, uh, the, um, the joy of spending time with family. Um, it, the same cannot be said here for Gertrude, who decided to knit a scarf for her husband in this meme, and I, I'm sure that we'll see uh, we'll see several developments in nine months from now, more kids and more divorces. <laughs> I think this is going to be a structural change uh, on that level as well. Um, April that we are seeing now is 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 quite different than than we what we've ever seen before. Uh, almost daily, we are hit by the news of another meat processing plant closing, um, not just because workers got the virus, but because other workers that did not get the virus are not showing up for work, which is not often something that's being talked about loud, loud enough. Um, and um, excuse me for a second. I, I, I told everybody at home I'm going to do a webinar. Now I'm hearing a clarinet in the background. I'll be right back. Because I, I hope everybody has seen that meme from a few years ago when a guy is doing an interview with BBC and then his uh, two kids are jumping in and then a wife slides in and tries to pull them out. Well, um, it's been very interesting giving giving interviews and webinars these days. Let's let me leave it at that. Um, April has been a month where we finally see the full impact of coronavirus in the United States. Just a few weeks ago. This almost national lockdown that we have with a pretty, pretty restrictive one in Michigan in particular, um, uh, and, and other states as well. Uh, just a month ago, this would have been impossible to imagine. Um, we, we are seeing the, the mercy ships for US Navy parked near our metro areas to, to help the local hospitals deal um, with the um, influx of patients. Um, uh, that, that have been uh, infected with the virus. Um, and, and the uh, recession outlook globally um, is, is quite dire. Um, so I have three um, little snippets here, two from International Monetary Fund and the front page from New York Times. Uh, in New York Times, I, I, you know, it's a sad situation, but it's an excellent graphic. You can see this um, yellow um, uh, chart here is a history of weekly unemployment claims going back 50 years. And then in March, when the lockdown started, you see how high it was. So this is this is a 30 standard deviations um, event. This is this is something that no numerical models um, could have foreseen that it would be this this dramatic. Um, in uh, according to um, uh, IMF, International Monetary Fund. Uh, we are to expect a contraction of 3% um, for 2020 with a rebound in 2021, which is quite optimistic that it, we would rebound that quickly and, and so strongly. Um, one thing that you should keep in mind is that when we talk about a great recession of 2009, in the United States, we've seen the GDP go down. In China, their recession was just a slower growth of GDP not actually the, um, uh, the, their growth at that point in time slowed down to 8%. You know, like you can imagine what, how fast your country is growing that when a 
when, when a big recession means only 8%, only 8% growth. Um, but this time around, they may actually see the GDP contract for real. Um, and and uh, in the United States, we have a lot of uh, space per person. It's a pretty big country, even though we are 330 million strong, it's a pretty big country. We can keep distant if needed. Uh, we have suburbs, we have you know, the, the urban sprawl, if you will, and a lot of rural, rural areas. Um, if you're in a developing country, you often don't have the luxury of, of uh, social distancing. Um, there, there are, you know, like within a like six square feet, there may, there's maybe five people around you at any given point in time you know, in the urban areas. So, so the um, coronavirus was bad for us, but wait until it hits Africa. You won't see them in statistics because they don't have enough tests, but it's, it's going to wreak havoc there as well. Um, uh, let's talk more about dairy. Uh, so we have two effects. You know, we have the retail effect and, and well, three effects. Retail effect, the export effect, and then the, the food service. Uh, retail is up um, and, and it had a pretty interesting dynamic. It went up a lot, then it went down once people realized they don't have to freeze milk, that more milk will be available in the stores. So for a while, it, they were sort of depleting all of that initial hoarding wave. But now it's up again because they realized, well, they still need to eat. Um, and you can't really just order pizza every day. Um, you know, so they started cooking as well. So butter is up a lot um, on a retail level because you use butter for cooking, cooking at home. Um, so all of these retail increases that, that have been great uh, were not nearly as sufficient to compensate for the loss of demand. Really, we should say demand destruction um, on the on the food service side. Um, so this is the. Um, these are the year-over-year -year changes in seated diners uh, uh, at restaurants um, globally. So it's not just the United States. It's not just um, uh, Western Europe. Around the world, people are not going to restaurants anymore. Uh, it's a pretty big deal for U.S. dairy uh, because in the United States, we had um, almost half of the butter go to restaurants. Uh, if you if you ever wonder why restaurant meals uh, tend to you know, um, taste better than homemade meals often, that's because of shallots and butter, basically. They have their own standard tricks to, to just, you know, saturate your palate and then you're like, hmm, this is a great chef. No, he's just using a lot of butter. Um, and then cheese as well, you know, almost half of the cheese uh, going through the food service. Uh, those sales are down 70% um, uh, in the food service se sector. Um, exports, we're still waiting for formal numbers uh, usually statistics are about two months late, um, so uh, we will have in early May, we will have March um, exports um, and anecdotal evidence suggests that it's sluggish, that, that the, the exports have gone down and uh, not just because, well, for, for three reasons, right? Um, first is the macroeconomic slowdown around the world um, as when people don't have sufficient disposable income. Um, they will not buy enough um, as, ma as much animal protein. Uh, second, um, folks are sick overseas as well. You know, so Mexico is, is also having an outbreak of coronavirus. So, so you know, their eating patterns have changed because of that as well. And then finally, um, the dollar is a world's reserve currency, uh, which means two things. First, that we can have this three trillion dollar stimulus. It sounds weird on the tongue when I say it. It's such an unbelievably large amount of money that, that, it, that it, you know, defies imagination. Other countries don't have anything nearly as much as that. In Europe, they, they had a fight for a week for over, over $400 billion uh, equivalent. And, and here, you know, like, that's, that's our extension of a pay, paycheck protection program. Um, we can borrow more money because dollar is a reserve currency without causing hyperinflation. Uh, on the other side, uh, dollar is getting more expensive relative to other currencies, so which may, makes our exports less competitive. Um, long story short, we are about 10%, um, uh, uh, we 10 percent of our dairy herd is not needed right now. We have about a million cows that that are um, that, that would need to be furloughed if if they were sort of our employees. Um, you know, but we can't do that. You can't just you know 
tell a cow to to stay, you know, to go home and you know watch Netflix for for three weeks and then come back and continue milking. Um, so what do you do? You either uh, introduce processor level supply management programs or you ask people to dump milk. Uh, and we've seen both happen across the country. Um, uh, Wisconsin, as what I'm hearing, is dumping five uh, percent uh, on a weekly basis, five percent of their milk production. That's huge for Wisconsin. Um, and, and other areas vary from week to week, but uh, typically they have oversupply uh, relative to demand. And uh, milk production report came out yesterday, over two percent growth year over year. Um, uh, uh, and um, you know, we were we were supposed to have a good year. People were gearing up for a good year. They were they were adding cows. They were expanding, and and now that milk won't be needed. Um, so, uh, and then yeah, I'm, I will skip this in the interest of time. So the question is, um, you know, well first, how did dairy prices reacted? Uh, they they fell, and you know, you, you, I know that all of you have followed markets uh, to some extent. You know, they. The, um, the the size of the drop is not unprecedented, but but it's um, but it's really helpful. Um, so you can see that in class three milk, um, we've seen it, the April June quarterly average price um, uh, go down from almost eighteen dollars um, uh, to uh, on January twenty fourth we we peaked at seventeen eighty eight, and and now it just keeps on falling. Uh, this is this was a few days ago at twelve forty. I think it might be even lower now. Um, plus four, we peaked at. <coughs> um, uh, here we were over seventeen bucks. Now again, eleven dollars. So this is like five, six, seven dollar decreases um, for this uh, second quarter of the year. Um, and it seems more and more that the great lockdown, as it's being um, uh, named. Uh, of 2020 will may actually be worse than the Great Recession of 2009. Um, 2009 dairy was a was a pretty devastating effect, uh, event. Uh, a number of dairies went bankrupt, uh, were foreclosed, um, and and uh, you know our prices were low for extended period of time. Um, the reactions from processors uh, here are a number of letters that I'm collecting and posting on Twitter. Uh, if you're if you're not following me on Twitter. Um, um, at Marin Bozic is my handle there. I, I try to stay relevant and and post uh, um, uh, tweets that may be of of use to you, useful to you. Not um, um, so. Uh, I'm posting these letters for two reasons. First, so that folks would know what's happening around the country, but also to uh, promote social norms um, in areas that don't have to dump. That um, if you can't make money on storing your product, and if you don't have sales for your product, uh, just because you have the ability to process that milk, maybe you're not doing your uh, growers a favor because it's keeping uh, accumulating stocks are keeping prices low. Um, so as much as I am opposed against uh, a national supply management because long-term uh, consequences um, would be detrimental for for creating a culture of personal responsibility uh, with risk management, both on the processor and the producer level. Um, I'm very much in favor of cooperatives and processors using uh, tools available to them to right size their milk supply as much as um, it hurts to have receive a letter asking you to dump or cut back by 10%. Um, uh, mass action along those lines will stimulate price recovery at a faster pace. Um, in face of all of this, um, you know, we are also seeing a robust dairy policy response. Uh, so two weeks ago, we had a debate uh, between Minnesota milk producers uh, proposal and the national milk proposal on um, on appropriate way to address the, um, the situation. In the end, USDA went with what I uh, suspected they will do all along, uh, just plain direct payments um, plus food purchases. USDA knows that they'll have to testify in front of Congress and they'll have to explain to senators and congressmen why did they allocate how much money to each sector. And having complicated uh, programs that are sector specific make those comparisons impossible to do. Um, and um, so they, they, and also like they have limited the ability to implement complex programs. 
um, uh, they're so understaffed and, and even the staff that's there, um, you know, they're overworked. Um, so, so they went with a very simple program of direct payments um, plus food purchases. Uh, so let's break some news also. Uh, some of you may have seen my tweet uh, two days ago. Uh, I was very concerned that the uh, Corona food assistance program payments, which is the new program introduced last Friday, that it may um, uh, claw back, that may reduce some payments for producers that have used their margin coverage or their revenue protection. As of an hour ago, we have the definitive confirmation from USDA, um, uh, from the person at USDA that's actually going to oversee the CFAP, the coronavirus payments, um, that it's not going to happen, that it's going to be, uh, that people that use risk management will not be penalized for doing that, implicitly penalized by having their um, coronavirus payments reduced. So that's great news. That that's great news. Um, uh, it's a, it's a right decision. I think that at this point in time, we have about forty percent of milk production in the United States covered through some form of risk management, whether it's DRP or DMC or or CME. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure how much more in forward contracts with with processors directly, but let's say that it's another five percent. We are approaching folks, a situation where very, very quickly will be a situation where majority of milk in the United States will be under some form of risk management. You know what it means? That means that a majority of milk will be opposed to bailouts. Um, that that uh, we, We've already seen that happen this year um, when their industry did not really want their margin coverage reopened. Of course, Senator Leahy from Vermont still wants it reopened because nobody in Vermont signed up because well, if you're in Vermont, you have your senator, you know, who's going to reopen it for you in case you need it. So that's your risk management. Um, well, those those days are over. Those days are are changing uh, going forward. Uh, there is going to be strong emphasis on personal responsibility with risk management, uh, proactively protecting against black swan events like this. In fact, in calendar year 2020, dairy revenue protection is projected to pay over one billion with a B. One billion dollars to to those that that have used it across all the endorsements and all the policies uh, nationally. That's twice as large as their margin coverage. Their margin coverage is the farm bill program targeting mostly small producers. Twice as large um, because it does not discriminate on size. Everybody can use it. If you have 50 cows or 500 or 5,000 cows, the ARP is open to everyone. Um, and the tool. That, that I've been working on with Greenstone and very grateful for this partnership will make sure that every producer also has the ability to have the best tool out there uh, at no cost to them to track their endorsements, to make meaningful decisions, to uh, track their projected revenue over the course of the year, even if they didn't do um, a lot of risk management yet. Um, so I've already covered this now. Um, so I'll skip this chart. Um, I think that we will see some structural changes as a result of these um, uh, uh, of the coronavirus. I think that we will lose about 10% of dairies uh, this year in the in Minnesota, Wisconsin. We were already close to that um, uh, last few years. In fact, we, we exceeded that. I think that we will see more of that happen in, in other parts of the country. Um, there is a big battle still being fought in DC right now uh, on payment limitations. Um, so the initial proposal by USDA anticipates $125,000 limit per uh, per farm, um, with some exceptions. They they have an exception that if you're a partnership or a sole proprietorship, that it's not a limit per farm. It's a, a limit per what they call actively engaged in farming person. So if you're a husband and wife, uh, wife couple that are managing a dairy that's not 125, but two times 125. If you have some kids. Um, then, then you can add them as well. Uh, if they're, as long as they are, you know, sharing in the risk of dairy that they partially own the dairy, provide some labor to it. There, the list of conditions. But bottom line is, it's not a strict limit on 125. It, it has some some scope for um, for augmentation of those payments to to certain kinds of uh, um, uh, large farms. But if you're an LLC, um, uh, you count as one person. Uh, you're one legal entity, and your limit is 125k. Um, at least the way that was announced last Friday. Uh, what I'm hearing right now is that there will be a letter, maybe it was sent already, um, a bipartisan letter from senators and congressmen 
uh, asking the White House to remove payment limits um, uh, for CFAP payments, CFAP again, coronavirus food assistance program payments. Um, why? Well, I mean, ultimately it's a government induced crisis. Um, it's a government decided that it, it's the best to lock down the economy to preserve human lives. Um, and, and as a consequence, producers of all sizes are, are suffering. Um, and we are fortunate as much as bad as bad as it's, it is to say it, but we are fortunate in dairy that we're only having um, uh, uh, revenue losses. And maybe you know some producers have 10, 15, 20 percent production cutbacks. What if our plants were, were like hog plants, and then you receive the new news that your plant is just shutting down because workers are not showing up, and they, you have no place to sell your milk at all? You know, they are now euthanizing uh, um, uh, swine. Yeah, you know, they're, they're euthanizing hogs and making mass graves uh, to make space for the next cohort, hoping that the next cohort. Of, of uh, pigs will, will find its market that we will be beyond this big way. Um, so all of this, uh, the, the removing payment limitations may help uh, those larger producers, not just in dairy, but in swine sector and other sectors uh, survive the crisis. I think that there's a big battle that's going to uh, be fought over that. Um, it's not uh, out of question that Congress will just outright uh, overrule the White House and write it into the next package um, ag package that I would expect would be there this summer um, that they remove payment limitations and apply that removal retroactively. Um, so, um, so that's the that's the background. I know this webinar was supposed to be um, uh, just on. Um, I'm going to skip a bunch of stuff here. Um, I know that this webinar was supposed to be just on DRP or primarily on DRP, but I don't think that would do you service because you need to understand what's happening in the world around you. Uh, as it influences your risk management decisions um, and, and also how you position yourselves for the next few weeks and maybe next few months. Uh, what is pretty clear right now is that we no longer have national unity regarding the lockdown, if we ever had it. Um, we, we are seeing some countries around the world um, deviating from this strategy. Sweden, in, per in particular, uh, is a very pragmatic country. They said, yeah, lockdown would be great if it could work. But you know, you know, those guys up in up north, uh, you know, they only see light a few months in a year, and uh, to tell Swedes that after they emerge from a seven or six month winter and darkness, that they have to now stay home until the next winter, like that just wouldn't work. You know, so so they 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 realize they have to do a different strategy. They have provided guidance on who should stay home and if you're going into public how you should behave but they did not restrict anything there were no shelter in place orders from their governor equivalent of governors or mayors etc um they had they are seeing higher death rate than other countries but it looks like it's leveling off um and and the debate that has um we really had it i, I was tracking it in the united states here from the beginning it started off with with some folks in ag um, uh, but we, we are going, going to have a pretty vibrant debate here uh, happening in the next few weeks on when is the right time to reopen the economy, how should we go about it, should we wait for sufficient number of tests to be available, or should we just sort of open it up and then let it rip and some people will die, but others will die if they, don't, if they can't provide for their families and, and they, uh, their businesses will die and, and then eventually you know, some of them may even commit suicide. Um, so tough, tough choices that will be upon every governor uh, uh, to to make, um, and you know, depending on where you are in which uh, state, if you make a decision that um, maybe the experts are telling you is right, but the general population doesn't like, you may be out of office in November. So this is a pandemic in an election year. Keep that in mind. That's why we are having a three tr trillion dollar stimulus, but that's also maybe why um, some states are rushing to reopen. Um, shouldn't say rushing, but, but they're moving swiftly to reopen. All eyes will be on Georgia these days to see what, what happens there uh, in Atlanta. Ironically, uh, uh, hospitals in Atlanta are going uh, bankrupt these days. Uh, they, they postponed all the elective surgeries uh, and other procedures, expecting a wave of COVID-19 patients that never materialized. Um, so, so, uh, um, so there's an underused hospital capacity there as well. Um, all of that needs to be taken into account. Uh, ultimately, it's not just 
Um, some people may have their risks done wrong um, uh, uh, or, or misunderstood, but there's, we have to understand that people have different risk preferences and that people have different tolerances to risk and that we are a country with a frontier mentality, an explorer and conqueror um, of, of the you know, new frontiers, both, both in geography as well as science, and that uh, keeping us locked up at home so that nobody dies is just not who we are as people at the end of the day. I'm not an epidemiologist. This is not an advice. I'm not advocating for public policy. You will not see me tweet about that. Um, but I would say that the concerns on both sides are legitimate, and ultimately it's not a scientific idea, uh, a decision that needs to be made, but, but a political one. Okay, so um, uh, my point with all of this is that there's a lot of uncertainty and that this event uh, that we have experienced the last few weeks may actually provoke a whole new era, that it may not be just a few weeks of kerfuffle and then we go back to normal. Um, how people order groceries will have forever changed after this. Uh, how they um, organize their lives and what's, what's feasible. Um, may have a long-lasting impact. You know, how we trade with our partners overseas may be a long-lasting impact as well. Um, uh, one of my favorite geopolitical, uh, geopolitics writers is uh, Peter Zion. I would, I would recommend to everyone to read his newsletters and, and his la latest book. I have no commission from it, um, but he was the one um, uh, calling for negative oil price a month ago. When, when it would be easy to dismiss something like that as like, come on, prices cannot be negative. Um, so where does all where does this all lead you in terms of dairy RP and in terms of uh, the the tools that you should use? Well, first I would say that if you haven't started looking into the 2021, um, uh, now is the time to start looking at that. Especially uh, if we have some rallies uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, once we see some states start to reopen, um, uh, once we see some optimism coming back. Uh, maybe in 10 days or so, we'll hear first clinical trial results from Remdesivir, uh, which is an antiviral drug developed by a company in California, uh, which basically uh, messes up the way the virus replicates. And, and the initial results suggest that it's highly successful in, in, uh, in promoting recovery from people. Um, once, we, once we have a little bit more science trickle in, uh, I think that we will see resurgence of optimism in the market. Um, and and the uh, uh, and 2021 may see higher prices. Um, uh, if not today, that would be a good time to start putting coverage in. So all, all of you, I hope you already have policies uh, um, uh, on file so that you're ready to pull the trigger the moment there is some opportunities. Because not all opportunities may last long. I think that we're going to have a long overhang uh, of this crisis and and. We may see a wave of optimism that that you know dwindles down as we as we get to the end of summer and there's a new wave of, of virus coming up. Um, so so use the opportunities that that will that will present themselves over the next few weeks or so. I, everybody should have policy in place even if you haven't uh, decided yet to pull uh, put an endorsement in. Um, I want to show you a little bit uh, how are people using DRP around the country. Um, so this is. Uh, how much milk is protected for the fourth nearby quarter? So how far out people are going? Uh, we, when we first opened the RP uh, in October 2018, um, only 10% of milk was was uh, hedged that far out. Um, for, I, I looked at it yesterday. I don't have it on the slide here, but a quarter of milk now is protected for that fourth and the fifth quarter out. In this case, that would be the second and the third, the third quarter of 2021. So people are moving further out. Um, you know the joke, you know, when, when two guys are, um, um, you know, running from the bear and one says, well, I don't have to be faster than the bear. I just have to be faster than you. I don't know if it's a joke or, or a saying. My point is that if your peers are well protected against shocks that happen a year from now, and you're just sitting on your hands waiting for $18 price to pull a trigger, well, guess what? If we do have um, it, the, either this virus situation or global recession not resolved by then, and they get two or three dollar per hundred weight payments, they will not be cutting back. They will not be going for close. They will not be balancing supply that or oversupply at that point. And if you don't have coverage, it may be you that have to sell cows at that point. So act soon. We will not have 
bailouts going on forever. We are moving towards a period where personal responsibility is going to be the um, uh, weapon number one against uh, 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 these price shocks in dairy. Uh, and more and more milk is being protected uh, far out. Um, also, at least currently, uh, we are seeing the trend towards more and more milk being protected through class three or class four and away from components. Um, July 1 of this year, we are introducing a new uh, feature of dairy revenue protection. We are introducing a uh, component price rating factor. What does that mean? That means that um, if you have high butterfat and, and protein, but a lot of your milk is priced off class four, you can declare those components to be priced off powder markets rather than cheese markets and whey markets. Um, so more details will be presented in weeks to come as we get closer to the next reinsurance here. But uh, I, 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 I'm really curious to see whether more people start using the components going forward. Um, summing up everything that I've told you so far before we go into tool, into the tool, um, here's how I would say in normal times your strategy should look like. Um, you start early, you go four or five quarters out, and um, and you, you know, gradually build your coverage, but you have a keen eye on um, you, you you have a, a close focus on whether you're covering your break even, and when there is an opportunity to really lock in your break even or better, then you move fast and you use that opportunity. And then if you miss that opportunity and you did not ever have it, and you get to the fr uh, front two quarters. Um, well, then you're you're basically looking to mitigate any further losses. So, so I had a webinar in late March. Prices are already about 14, 15 bucks. So most for most people, they're already in the red. They're already losing money. Um, people were very hesitant to buy coverage at that point in time for DRP, and I told them, guys, um, this is not the end of it. This is not the nadir of this crisis. You got to move into loss mitigation mindset. Um, you're keeping all of the upside. If we recover quickly, you get to ride at upside. But put a floor. You know, even your feet. Even if you're, even if you're a little bit underwater, there you can still breathe. You can still stand on that floor, and at least your neck will be above the water. If even if if most of your body is underwater, you have to torture that metaphor a little bit. Um, those guys that that acted that same day when I did the webinar, they were in the money by next Monday. That's how fast the market moved um, and, and it hasn't been going up since. Uh, so in normal times, you would uh, look for distant quarters for break even protection and then those nearby quarters for either opportunistic hedging. If you have have a really high floor that you can lock in or, or you say, screw it, you know, I got to I got to put a floor, even if it's below my break even um, uh, just because I may lose the farm if this goes down any further. So this is for normal times. Um, how do you how do you treat this in in these abnormal times in the um, in these times of coronavirus? I, I think you need to look all the way out um, in, with a lot lo loss mitigation plans. Uh, who knows how long this is going to last? I certainly don't. Um, you know, um, I, I want to sound optimistic, and every time I talk with people one on one, I you know I ask them for their health, I ask them for their family, I try to tell them a joke, I try to get their spirits up higher. But when it comes to finances. Um, you, you, you know what, your, your repayment capacity won't feel better, you know, just because you talk with someone who tells you a few jokes. You know, it will feel better if you, if you can sleep you know, at peace at night, you know, because you have some level of protection um, put in that far out. Um, so, so for these times, I would say that um, look for the second and third quarter of 2021. July 1 will open the last quarter of 2021. Uh, talk with uh, Ryan, talk with... Um, uh, Robert, talk with you know, um, with your lenders, you know, uh, Ben or or others at uh, Greenstone. Uh, make a plan together. Make a plan, not for the best of times. Nobody needs a plan for the best of times. It's sort of like you'll just make it through. Um, make a plan for the worst of times. You know, so how are you going to make it through if we do have an extended um, uh, down cycle? If we do have a global macro uh, recession that that goes on for a while, you know, you know uh, the the prices. As of even on Monday of this week, weren't that bad you know, uh, in 2021. Uh, maybe they're not at a level when you're breaking even. Maybe the premium seemed a little high for your taste, um, but you got to start. 
you know, that would be my advice. You know, if you don't want to lock in 100%, I'll understand. Start with 5% a week or 5% every two weeks, and then reevaluate with your agents every two weeks, whether it's time to buy up more aggressively or maybe a little more slowly, but, you know, keep it on a glide, you know, keep, keep increasing. Um, don't just sit on your hands. You know, if you, if you do it that way, you'll never miss a rally. Um, you won't cover everything at the, at the best rally, but you'll never miss a rally because whenever there is a rally, you'll, you'll cover a little bit more of your milk. Whenever you don't like the price, maybe you'll cover a little bit less, but you'll never find yourself at you know, three months to the quarter uh, starting and you have zero coverage because you just never like the prices and, and then the prices are 12 and now you really don't like it. Um, so anyway, so that, that's my, that's my uh, waxing poetic about the market's politics and the cosmos. Uh, let's take a look at uh, how the, the tool that we built together, uh, the, your Greenstone guys and I, how can, that can help you uh, manage risk. So uh, I'm going to switch here from the PowerPoint um, to the Web browser. Okay, I might have to, uh, let's see if it will let me. Um, I think I was talking for more than 15 minutes. Yeah, so I'll have to uh, log in again. Okay, so this is the front screen of the, of the tool that we built together. Um, it's a tool that is constantly evolving. We are adding new features about every six weeks or every two months or so. We're working on them continuously. I have a team of uh, almost 10 people at this point, 10 engineers working co continuously on building new features here. Um, and, but I think we, it's, it's already a, a tool that's head and shoulders above the competition. Um, so you'll get the best service here. Uh, what is the tool about? What does the tool allow you to do? Well, first of all, it allows you to see what the daily quotes are. Um, and we have the daily quotes within a few minutes of RMA releasing the prices in the afternoon. You can see uh, every, uh, every quarter uh, in detail, or you can see full five quarter all at once. Um, so this is, these are the prices for uh, April uh, 20th, which is uh, Monday. We, we did not have prices yesterday because of uh, milk production report. We don't have them today because of cold storage report. Tomorrow we're back in business with new sales. Um, so you can see the, the prices for full five quarters all on a single screen. Um, you can see what your uh, expected revenue and the revenue guarantee would be under both components as well as class uh, policy. You can see the, the prices that you can cover and the premium that you would have to pay. And you know what? 28 cents for April, June 2021 sounds like a delicious deal to me. It's been over 40 cents just two weeks ago. So I guess the volatility calmed down there. A little bit. Um, you can, uh, once you have your own historical prices inserted into the tool, we will help you also look at the basis. So you can look at not just what is the DRP headline number, but what does it mean for your farm? What is the floor that you're putting on your farm? It's an approximate floor because, you know, historical performance doesn't always match what's going to happen going forward. In particular, if you're in Michigan, your basis may improve next year if that new cheese plant is on time. I wonder, I hope they don't delay it. Well, I don't know what to think, whether I should hope or not, but uh, if it is on time, uh, your basis is going to improve next year because there'll be more local demand for milk. Uh, and yet at the same time, the, the national prices for cheese may go down because we'll have um, more supply of cheese. Um, so once you account for basis, you can see the revenue floor that you're putting on your, on your dairy, both in terms of uh, classes and components, um, and and uh, and you can see the historical performance uh, last ten years, uh, how frequently something would have paid, and and whether you would have made money on it. Um, so if you're going the, with the nearby quarter, which is something I do not recommend, I do not recommend that you consistently hedge nearby quarters. Uh, if you do that, the, your indemnities are going to be sprinkled over time. But if you look at really big crisis like 2008 and even 2020 now, there's not much payments there. Um, you know, like you'll be too late to the game. Uh, you know, if, you were, if you were protecting uh, Q2 of this year on the last day that the sales were available, you already missed the boat. Uh, you know, the time to do that was, was much earlier. So on the other hand, if you go four or five quarters out, for example, um, you know, you look historically what would happen, your, your indemnities would be clustered and there would be 
uh, abundant in years when you really need them. So look at 2009 here, a really good year for a person that would consistently hedge four quarters out. Of course, you have to be disciplined to do that. This is not a game for um, uh, for everyone because then you will see maybe two or three years of no indemnities. And if you have, for example, partners in your business that are not good with risk management, they will ask you, well, what is it that you're doing? You're burning all our money and we, don't, we haven't seen an indemnity for two and a half years. Yep. And then we'll have a virus and your partners will be, you're a genius. <laughs> you knew this is going to happen. No, I didn't know. Nobody knew. But that's the whole point. If everybody knew when virus was going to strike, there would be no opportunity to hedge against it. Because anything that everybody knows is already priced in. And you're banking on people's ignorance. That's why you're able to get good margins four or five quarters out. Because nobody has a clue what's going to happen in 2021. That's why the prices are in 2021 than in the Q2 of, of 2020. The tool will give you the ability to, um, to look back 10 years or even longer and see how different trading strategies, different hedging strategies would perform for you. Um, then there's a what if analysis here where you can uh, change the price of a particular commodity or milk price and see how that impacts your indemnities. So let's say, so we are now looking at um, April, June, 2021, and butter is at dollar seventy. Oh, how sweet that price looks like right now! And if somebody told you butter dollar seventy, you know, two months ago, what would you say? Are you crazy? That's slow. We, we want at least two bucks. <laughs> how times change. Um, cheese dollar sixty four. Oh, beautiful dollar sixty four. But what if it's not that? What if the coronavirus persists and we are down to dollar twenty for all three months of uh, spring twenty twenty one? You can modify those prices here, see what it does to class three prices. We went down from 1566 to 1296, and you can see how much money you would get. You would get $1.64 per hundredweight. Now, in this particular case, uh, the policy is on a million pounds. If, if you're protecting 20 million pounds, well, that's 20 times uh, more money here. So this scales up with your operation. Um, you can store a scenario and share it with your partners, or you can ask your banker or a crop insurance agent to prepare a scenario and store it with you, and then you can load it here in scenarios. We, we can go through that if anybody has a question. In the interest of time, I'll move on. Um, you can track all your endorsements and see how much they will pay out. So uh, here, this is a demo operation for Greenstone, uh, by the way. Um, uh, acres. Here we go. Um, so you can see here um, the October, December, January, March. You know, by each quarter, you can see how much money you declared, how much money are you paying in total dollars, for example. What is your revenue floor, and what is your total indemnity that you can expect? So this particular operation, uh, this particular demo operation, can expect. 1.6 million dollars um, in the second quarter of 2020. Uh, that's a pretty good deal. That's that's the kind of money that really helps. Not the CFAP 125k. You know, just adds insult to injury um, with those payment limitations. Um, so you can track your entire portfolio very easily and on a daily basis get updates how each of your endorsements uh, may be paying out and and what the indemnity estimates um, are going to be. Um, here you can see. Uh, for each quarter, how much did the um, uh, expected income go down since you purchased uh, the endorsements, and then how much the indemnity uh, went up? So typically, this green line and green line will go in the opposite directions. So if the if the market is better than anticipated, you will not get any payments, but you, your market will be better than anticipated. So in the fourth quarter of 2019, um, uh, the the guy running this dairy paid almost $40,000 for, for premiums, didn't get anything back. Did he do a bad decision? No, because the income was almost more than $600,000 higher than he thought it was going to be at the time when he was purchasing the endorsements. The market went up. So you can see here how the your income and indemnities move in opposite directions, and, and you can feel good about the premiums you've paid. If you didn't receive indemnities, you can feel good that if the if you have a deep drop in income, the indemnities will compensate 
for that. Um, we are currently working on uh, on much expanded projection charts here. So uh, this is going to be much more um, sexy when I show you in a month. We have another webinar here in May. Uh, but long story short, we'll have a single screen where on one page you'll have your projected revenue. Now, what's a projected revenue? You tell me how much milk you're going to make, um, and you, you give me historical prices, and you choose projection model when you want you want class three, class four, or mix. And then every day, based on futures, we'll give you a projection of your revenue for the rest of the year, even if you have zero endorsements with DRP. So you know how the rest of the year is going to look like on your dairy, even before you do any risk management. And then that table that we are right now building, I have literally you know half dozen engineers working on it today. Um, that table will also show you um, where the revenue floor is. And once you once you sum up what you're going to get from your creamery and what you're going to get from your insurance agency, total revenue, what it's going to be for a year. So come back in a month and I'll show you that table in action. It's going to be pretty cool. Um, we have uh, videos. So if you, uh, if you can tolerate my, my European accent, you will enjoy this section here. Um, it, it will uh, take you through the uh, you know, federal order pricing for, uh, for formulas. If, if you, uh, you know, all the questions you never cared to ask uh, and maybe more than you ever cared to know, uh, but it's all here on how class three and four come together, how protein comes together. Um, you can see um, the the market dynamics. We'll go through that now. Uh, you can see various features of the tool are described here on these videos. They will guide you through them. Uh, and I keep on recording these videos whenever I'm not fighting some nonsense coming out of DC on the dairy policy space. This is what I'm trying to do. Um, um, assuming that my kid falls asleep. Um, ever ever since we lost the nanny, I lost. 75% of my working hours. Maybe that's why I want, that's why I want the economy reopened. Um, okay, uh, one more important section uh, on the tool, uh, market dynamics. Uh, in the market dynamics tab, uh, you can see daily changes in prices for a quarter of your choice. Uh, you can track it, uh, the quarters that are currently on sale uh, as well as those that are not longer on sale. For example, April, June is no longer on sale but you can still track how it's evolving over time. Uh, you can do that for class three, class four prices. You can see them overlaid together, uh, or you can put together uh, milk and cheese, for example, and, and see how they follow each other. Um, there are some historical prices here. So what's the latest price? Uh, last seven days, lows and highs, last 30 days, and then the life of contract. Um, here are all the historical prices. So you can go back to year 2000, depending on how far back you want to go. Um, and you can see historical prices for class three milk. And what this is saying is that this price of 1164 uh, is higher than 24% of observed uh, January to March prices, 25 of all observed April to June prices. And if we go back, you see that you know we had 941, 962 in 2000, uh, 2003. Now you may say, well, oh, well, that was 20 years ago. Feed was different. Labor was cheaper. That was, oh, it's not really comparable. That's fine. Fair point. You can restrict it to 2012 to the last seven, eight, nine years. And then you can see that we are right now living in unprecedented times. There are no historical prices, uh, maybe even in this decade uh, behind us in 2010s, uh, there were no historical prices that were, that are as low as these prices today. Um, you can look at a calendar. So right now you can see that cool storage, uh, the, uh, today there are no sales. Yesterday we had milk production. Uh, tomorrow we'll have the actual prices and milk per cow released for January, March, 2020. Uh, and we'll release the expected milk per cow for July, September, uh, 2020 through July, September, 2021. So uh, as I'm doing this webinar, on a different computer, the code is busy running all the simulations so that we are on time um, sending those uh, those data to to RMA by noon tomorrow. It's always hectic. Uh, five times a year, I have to produce those statistics uh, for RMA uh, so you can so that your insurance agencies can get the new data to you. Um, so that's the calendar. Um, uh, the alerts are pretty cool feature. So what can you do with with alerts? Um, so. Uh, 
alerts. So these are uh, two alerts that were set up for Dream Acres. Um, and um, alerts basically just you know give you the ability to track markets on your own terms and say, okay, I'm not gonna do I'm not gonna buy endorsement now, but let me know when class three price rises above 14. Then I'm gonna be interested. Or let me know when this price falls below when when cheese drops below buck fifty because I know that then it's really time to act because it's no joke anymore. So you can add an alert. Um, you you can add an alert on the expected DRP price or futures price, or you can create your own you know desired endorsement if you will uh, price with butter fat or protein or mix of class three and four. We'll track those prices every day for you. Whenever we fall, whenever the price either falls below or goes above your trigger, uh, we'll let you know by a text message and an email that it's that your your alarm um, has gone off and it's time to contact your agent and do something about it. Um, so those are the alerts. Um, I have a lot more plans for this tool. Uh, uh, my my big plan is that we were really able to put together a coalition of currently nine farm credits. I'm hoping that it's going to be twelve soon. Um, you know, that allows them to jointly invest um, to upgrades more than any single individual company would be able to do, like Blimling or Rice Dairy or others. Um, and and we can do wonders with this tool over the next year. So June one of this year, if not sooner, we'll have the new um, iPhone app um, that you will be able to access at no extra cost to you if your association and Greenstone will participate in that. Um, July one of next year. Again, if you like my accent, or at least can tolerate it, I'll be at your service once a week um, or once every two weeks, depending on how your association would want to do it. Um, so, so I'm happy to answer any questions, tell you what's happening in DC, tell you what's happening in the markets, um, you know, and uh, give you the latest scoop. I will never tell you what to do. I will tell you what to think about, um, and then ultimately it's your money if you if you play it nicely, and and it's your farm to lose if you don't listen to me. <laughs> So I'm a pretty opinionated guy, but I'm also respectful uh, of everybody and their and your freedom. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I think this may be a good uh, stopping point. Uh, I know that I went, I used the full hour. That's a professional hazard of giving a mic to a university professor. But I hope that everything that I said today is at some level uh, useful for your decision making. Um, and uh, Amber, back to you. All right, thank you, Marin. Um, we do have a couple questions for you. Um, so I'll just read them from the chat to start. Um, when is a good time to use the 1.5 factor for coverage? Always. Here's why. Um, if, uh, there is a limit to how many pounds you can declare. You can declare, um, if you declare, let's say, if you make 10 million pounds a quarter, and you declare 15 million, but you're not gonna get payments on full 15 million because you have to actually be milking cows to be participating in this program. So there is a rule in the program that says that if you make less than 85% of what you declared, that your indemnities are going to be scaled downward. So you can get exactly the same payments if you declare 15 million and choose protection factor one, and if you declare 10 million and choose protection factor 1.5. So you can think of protection factor at, in two different ways. You can think of protection factor as either augmenting your indemnities and covering your deductible, that, that 5%. Uh, so you, the highest you can go is 95% of expected revenue, right? If you choose protection factor 1.5, prices fall low enough, you will have covered that gap. That's one way to think about protection factor. The other way to think about protection factor is that you can just declare about one third less of your pounds, and then you can think of your declared pounds times the protection factor as how much milk you have really protected. So if you protect 10 million, if you declare 10 million pounds and you choose protection factor of 1.5, that's exactly equivalent, folks, to declaring 15 million pounds with protection factor of one. One change only. If you declare 10 million and go with one five, the a minimum amount of, amount of milk you can produce is 8.5 million. So if you produce anything above 8.5 million, no questions asked. Even though you really wanted to protect maybe 15 million 
and then you're shipping to a processor that told you to cut back 20%. So you're now at 12, you're really grumpy about it. But if you declare 10, use one five, no questions asked. Your full 15 million will, will be honored. You'll get the indemnities and all of that. So, so the answer is always, you know, if you can wrap your head around it, if you can really get uh, to understand uh, really well how protection factor works, um, there is really no reason to go anytime anything less than one five uh, on that. Great, thanks. Uh, we do have another email question. Is there a tool to calculate federal PPD built-in? Okay, so we can build that uh, if, if you guys really want it, uh, but it's not very useful. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's why I didn't prioritize it. Here's why. Um, PPD can be either positive or negative. If PPD is negative, uh, your buyer may have depooled. So your basis and your milk check may not be fully reflective of that negative PPD um, because they are not uh, likely to pay the federal order minimums at that point. Um, and also, if, if you're with a cooperative, and there's a really nice big PPD positive, uh, they may not pass that all to you. They don't have to pay minimum prices. Um, so in this version of the tool, I try to avoid using PPD and I'm just simply asking you, um, uh, uh, what is your mailbox milk price that you received over the last three years? So here's, here's that, right? I'm just simply asking you, what's your mailbox milk price that you received over the last three years? And then we look at the difference between the dairy RP historical prices and your mailbox milk prices, and that gives us the the, the uh, historical basis that is then used in a quarter here. But that said, uh, if uh, if you guys really want it, we can build it. You know, we again we will we will continuously innovate and upgrade this tool and add uh, more to it. You know, as people want it. So, so if there's a strong desire to do that, um, do reach out to Robert or Ryan or uh, Ben or Ben, and uh, and you know just say that that's really critical for you, and we'll build it in. I know how to do it. We just didn't we didn't, we didn't prioritize it right now because I wanted to keep it simple for you. Okay, thank you. Um, we do have one more before we open it up to callers. Um, how would organic producers use the DRP or the tool? So there are there are two uh, aspects there. Uh, first, you have to ask yourself whether your price is going to fall as much as the conventional price. Um, and and if they are moving in tandem, which they are not, I know they're not. I know that, that typically organic prices, at least historically, have been more stable than conventional prices because a lot of buyers had supply management programs in place. Um, but if your price is moving down with conventional price, then the basis may be 10 bucks. But if conventional price drops down five bucks, maybe your price will drop down by five bucks as well. So really that the, the, the correlation between changes is what matters. Um, and if you put in, uh, if, you, if you go into the tool and you put in your historical prices here, um, which may be again in the 20s or high 20s or maybe even lower, lower 30s, um, depending on you know, where you're shipping and et cetera, uh, then when you go to the quarter, you will see the basis here, maybe, maybe it will say 10 bucks. And so if I put in 10 bucks here, um, you can see that um, the expected revenue floor should have changed. You can see that I have a bug, here we go. Oh no, it did change. It did change, it's just it was so low to begin with that I thought that 23 was a, a bug. Oh my God, we are really in bad times. So right now it's 17. If I put basis of 10 bucks, um, yeah, I guess, yeah, it is, yeah. Uh, we went from two to 10, so that's about eight bucks more. Yeah, so you, so you can see what your revenue floor is if you, if you modify the basis either manually, and if you input your historical data, then the tool will calculate the basis for you. And you know what, if you're, uh, the only problem arises if you have organic prices falling even when conventional prices are staying stable. So I know that uh, recently we've seen some big guys uh, get certified organic 
uh, and then they start shipping a lot of milk to organic market, and then they that happened before coronavirus. So the organic prices started tanking even as conventional prices were going up. Um, that that's basis risk. You know, the this program currently does not um, allow you to uh, it does not offer the protection against that that particular constellation of events when conventional goes up and organic goes down because we don't have any futures on organic milk. If we had futures on organic milk, I would be you know, um, uh, happy as a pig to build it for you, but I just don't have anything to work on. All right, Correct thanks, you. Mayor. Um, so I am going to unmute the people who called in just so they can have a few minutes just to ask any questions that they would like to. Okay, so there are four people who called in that are still on the line, and you now have the opportunity to ask a question if you like. All right, maybe uh, if we have no questions, maybe maybe Amber, we can uh, ask uh, Ryan and. And Robert to offer a few thoughts on what they see happening in the markets. How many people do we still have on the webinar? Did I put everyone to sleep? <laughs> no, no, we have about 54 people left. Okay, great, great. Uh, Ryan, you want to say a few words? You, 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 you got to unmute him, uh, Amber. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess everything. Just reinstating what everything Marion said about the markets. Um, Obviously, it's not a great time. Um, I guess this might be an opportunity as well to um, introduce myself. So I'm I'm, I'm the um, one of the ma I'm the main uh, DRP specialist for the state of Michigan. So um, if you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to me um, as well as your um, current specialist. Um, but uh, we're, we're as Greentone trying to make DRP a, a main priority and making sure that we are doing the best by and for our customers for this program. So, um, you know, just being, you know, educated on everything um, by one person um, is helping a lot with um, getting that information out to you. Um, I do a daily email out to all the all, all customers um, that I have an email for. Um, so if you're not on that email, you know, feel free to um, email me or uh, get your um, email to me through your specialist or through your loan officer to get on that list um, just a summary of what's happened that day in the in the dairy markets like um, yesterday I gave a um, update on what the milk production report said specifically and then today will be cold storage um, and then as well as I usually attach um, a quote for usually class three that is created by our DRP analyzer tool just to give you an idea where prices are at just to keep you in the know um, there's a lot of things that uh, the DRP program has in, in it and it's a lot of uh, could be confusing at times so um, using different strategies and doing different things um, is definitely um, on a farm by farm basis. So um, definitely keep in contact, especially in this time, you know, where it's such unknown and, you know, premiums are coming down. So like Marin said, there's a, there's some good opportunities out there, especially looking at, you know, 2021, I see markets are up a little bit today, um, even though DRP is not for sale, but um, hopefully we'll have some good opportunities and uh, we're here to help you. Uh, figure out risk management and what's best for your farm, so. Great, thanks, thanks, uh, Ryan. Uh, Robert, you wanna add a few words? Yeah, sure. I think risk, risk management on the dairy operation, we're really seeing it gonna change in the future. Um, like you said, Marin, um, the 125 limit on the operation, that's probably, I think we're hearing about $1.60 a hundred weight, so about 300 cows or more dairy. Um, anything larger than that's going to pretty much tap out that 125. And like you said, the use of DRP is going to become more popular because of that second quarter on this operation of the 1.6 million um, is going to be the difference maker. Um, the programs that we have in place, EMC is projected at what, 90 to 100,000 on 5 million pounds right now. Those are going to be great on our small operations, but on the large operations going forward, you're Correct. Um, those amounts are not a large enough indemnity to make a difference. So this is going to be the playmaker or the difference maker with risk management going forward. And laying out in futures is going to be the key. 
especially knowing your break evens and putting a risk management plan into place uh, for the future and your marketings is going to be the big difference. Um, it's going to be, I don't want to spend, I understand the 20 cents a hundred weight is difficult, but it's going to be a cost of operation now, I believe. So it's going to go right into the cost of production and it's going to be just a cost of doing business going forward. Yeah, um, yeah. Revenue is our milk sales or milk is the number one revenue on the dairy operation, not call cows, not anything else. Um, it really is the milk and we need to protect that revenue. Yeah. And the nice thing you said, it, it's a cost of doing business. Uh, and the nice thing is, you know, when, when you talk about, oh, should I add, should I balance amino acids, this or that, like you always look at, you know, how much the incremental cost would be an incremental return in terms of, you know, pounds of milk per cow per day, et cetera. Well, on that 25 or 30 cents that you would invest in DRP because it's a subsidized program, uh, you could have returns of, you know, 80% over the over 10 year period, um, you know, because the premium is consistently lower than the fair market value of the insurance you're buying. So over time, uh, not every quarter, maybe not, maybe you'll, you'll have a few dry years in a row, but if you do it consistently, if you know what you're doing over a long run, you're going to increase your net income by maybe another you know, 20, 30 cents. Not just return your premium, but increase your net income by 20, 30 cents per hundred. You know, so, so it's a, you know, which other, you know, which other additive can you think about or, or, or feed ingredient that has like 80% return on, on, on adding it? Everybody would using it in, the, in their feed, no? You know, so it, it's a, it's a, it is a cost of doing business. You got a budget for it, but it's a, really good budget item in terms of for it, what it gives you. It gives you a lot when you need it the most and it gives you a lot full stop. You know, so um, anyway, you know, fully agree with you, Robert. Um, uh, uh, ben uh, Spitzley, I wanted to uh, just query you a little bit. Uh, what, what do you see on the lender side and, and what would you say will be the, some long-term ramifications of this coronavirus and, the, uh, and, and the, the changes that you see in dairy sector in, in terms of what it means for, for risk management going forward? Yeah, thanks, Martin. So I guess I'd just take it from the standpoint of maybe what, what to expect if you're, when you're going to talk to your lender and how we're digging into these and, and reviewing our analysis. Uh, you know, you, you should have, if you haven't, you should have a projection end to your lender. And that was likely based on a higher milk price, understandably. But, you know, now we're going to we're going to take that. We're going to test it versus current prices. We need to be able to support it. So if you come with, you, know, you need payment relief, you need uh, additional working capital, what have you. We're, we're going to look at those opportunities. We don't have any type of blanket dairy program uh, that we're underway yet. You know, we look at case by case and uh, we'll customize to fit, fit the individual. Um, but we want to. We're going to take that projection. We're going to sensitize it, and, and we need we need to be able to demonstrate that there's what are the things that are going to keep it afloat. Okay, we talked about some of the USDA programs, so you'll get the you're going to get the CFAP payment. Uh, maybe you got a PPP loan, uh, and what's the floor that you have in place? What where did you protect a margin? That's, that's what we're going to really try to fact, factor in and, and determine what, what type of working capital and equity get, get burned up during this downturn. So what, it's going to be on top of mind. Uh, just expect to hear, to get the question, you know, what, uh, what do you have for a floor, whether it's BRP or some other hedging strategy, it's going to be imperative and will be asked even more so going forward. So. Other, you know, beyond that, it's we're we're relying on how much equity you have to get through this. Yeah, yeah, you hear it. Uh, just wanted to show everybody uh, something that's coming up shortly here, uh, very much along the lines of what what Ben just said. So, if you come back in May on May webinar, I think that we're we're going to have this uh, functional by then. So this is that revenue and projections uh, page. Currently, just a chart there. Um, but we are adding this table below. The idea is that to have on one place everything that your lender may want. So by quarter, they'll tell you uh, uh, what your projected milk production is. 
um, what your expected price is based on daily futures, basis either something that you have inputted and saved or historical, uh, uh, based on that projected mailbox milk price, based on that projected revenue. So you would have this projected revenue number even if you did zero endorsements on DRP, because that's the money you can expect from your from your buyer. Um, then we'll have a block where that which analyzes the revenue floor on on DRP basis here. So you can see the historical basis and adjust it if you don't like it, um, uh, and then uh, what the revenue floor is that you're putting. On, on your dairy there. Um, and then at the end, we'll have the total profit analysis where we'll give you the estimates for indemnities. This 100,000 is just, you know, this is just a mock. We're just putting some random numbers in so that my engineers would know what to do. You know, we'll, we'll give you the, uh, you know, the, the cost of production and then we'll sum up the indemnity estimate with your, how much money we project you'll get from your from your buyer uh, co-op or, or private processor we'll put that all together that's your projected hedge revenue uh, might we might rename it uh, and then in, you'll see your projected net income for the quarter there um, so that's this round and then down the road i would also love to uh, put a what if scenario on your entire portfolio so you can move the prices for the year and see how your net income varies based on how much you you have hedged um, and then also uh, um, uh, how that influences down the road even further, uh, how that influences your you know, ability to service your debt, how that influences your um, uh, liquidity, working capital, equity position, et cetera. So I have big plans for this tool going forward. I, I've been dreaming of this for years. And when the coalition of farm credits was finally put together, uh, thanks in no small part to, to Ben Malich here, um, the, uh, the only speaker I didn't call upon. Hi, Ben. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So th this allowed us to put in practice all the insights that I've been working on as a university researcher, from you know hedge far out to the relationship between financial ratios and, and risk management, um, etc. So uh, we hope to serve you well, uh, and we always listen to your feedback, and we always try to do better. Uh, so so uh, I hope you liked what you heard today. Anything that you would like us to do. In addition to what you've seen, please communicate that to, to Ryan or Robert or Ben uh, or, uh, or or Ben Malich, and then you know we'll we'll get to work and we'll we'll get it done for you. Um, uh, we want to create a one-stop shop for all your risk management needs uh, down the road. So so you have everything on one screen and and you can take it in the pocket of your um, shirt and and have it on the go as well. Uh, comprehensive yet minimalistic. That's that's my credo. You know, and that's, that's what I try to do in everything I do. That's why DRP is so simple. Uh, it's very complicated to get to a simple design. <laughs> well, that's all I have, Amber. All right, thank you, Ian. You wrapped up nicely for us, and thank you for, uh, I mean, you provided us lots of valuable information today. Um, if anyone had any questions that we didn't get to or that we didn't see, feel free to email um, Ryan, Robert, or either Ben, or you can email webinar at greenstonefcs.com and then we can follow up with you. We will be doing a post event um, communication to you all later this week, um, just to kind of give you um, more information on what we heard today and then our contact information as well. So thank you all for um, attending and thanks for just kind of taking the time to listen to what we had to say today. We hope you found it valuable. Um, and uh, everyone have a great week and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Amber, for organizing. Thank you all. Have a good day.